Hello there, you lovely people. I hope you're safe and I hope that you're well. So as we draw to our two year anniversary with having the Flourish YouTube channel, I thought that I'd do something special for this particular video. And I'm delighted to be joined by the incredible Paralympian, Danny Crates. So hi there, Danny. Hi, how you doing? You all right? So Danny, my first question to you is, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself, please? Yes, I'm Joe. So I was uh, I, I was born with two arms. Uh, I was involved in a car crash when I was 21 years old, uh, whilst travelling in Australia, and the result was I actually lost my arm in the accident. But I was always determined to not let that define me, but almost define what I was going to become. I guess is the way I look at it. So sport has always been my passion, my love. So one of the first things I did was I got back into sport. Uh, that first sport was rugby. So I went back to my local club, Thurrock in Essex, and started playing rugby again. Um, not initially playing, but just training, and then eventually playing. So one year after my accident, I was playing full competitive, able-bodied rugby. And then from then, I went uh, and started looking at what I was going to do for a career. And my passion was scuba diving. So I went back to Australia. I trained as a scuba diving instructor. And I worked out there for nine months on the Barrier Reef, teaching people to dive. Unfortunately, when you come back to the UK, it's not as clear and not as warm as Australia. So I had to find a way to use scuba diving in the UK, which is when I did the daftest job I've ever done. And I became a shark display diver, um, which was a pretty cool job, but uh, probably not the most sensible job. So I did that for a period over the summer. Uh, in amongst all that, I was working for a charity, uh, teaching people with disabilities to scuba dive. And then eventually I ended up back in a sport that I'd done when I was younger and at school and a sport that I'd always loved, which was athletics. And, and there started what became a 12 year international athletics career. So I went to my first major games, which was the World Championships in 98. I came away, I got made the final of the 400 and uh, came away eighth. But to me, eighth was just last in the final. And I started working on what I needed to do to try and get me onto the podium because the podium looks a lot more fun. Uh, and over the next two years, I put in all the work and made all the changes I needed to make to get me to that position. I went to my first Paralympic Games, which was Sydney 2000, uh, where I came away with a bronze medal in the 400 metres. But I knew that there was still more in me. And if I sort of changed more things, worked even harder, potentially I could get that top spot, which is even more fun, which you get the national anthem and, and the flags and all that. So I also went through a change and I changed the event. I was now racing two laps, the 800 metres. And in 2004, I achieved my dream and I became the Paralympic champion. A dream that took me seven years to win. And that's what I think people have to be mindful of as well. It wasn't an overnight dream. It was seven years in the making. And then in 2009, I finally became a world champion. And that, that, that dream was the third attempt and nine years in the making. And then in 2008 at the Beijing Games, I had the honour of being the flag carrier, uh, led my team out into the opening ceremony. But sadly, the next day, suffered an injury that had been reoccurring all year and was unable to compete. And in 2009, I retired. And then post-athletics, I've tried to keep challenging myself, keep pushing myself, keep stretching myself. So I've done multiple different things. I've done, uh, I've ridden a bike from John O'Groats to Land's End, uh, top of Scotland to the very, very bottom of England. I've done multiple marathons. I've done um, SS selection marches. I've been on Celebrity Master Chef. I am um, my business now is I'm a keynote speaker. I've worked within schools for 20 years, but I also work in businesses as well. That's my primary well. My business is placed within businesses, helping them understand what high performance looks like. And I have a business consultancy and I'm a dad of three kids. So I keep myself quite busy, um, just as many people do. And I still try and go for the odd occasional run, although it's a lot slower now than it used to be. And you just you're so right. You forget about how many years it takes and how much hard work goes into that so whenever I watch I love athletics I love sport how does it feel when you win I know that most probably is a really hard question but how do you, how does it feel when you win I think it depends what circumstances you win under if you're into competition or championships and you're not necessarily expected to win or you do better than expected it's not it's not always about winning it's about doing the best you can do on the day winning is giving your best performance and if your best performance puts you on in the number one spot then you've won if your best performance you run a personal best and you make the final you've won if you if you go out in the heats but you still run a personal best you've won like you've delivered your best performance on the day that you were supposed to do it but of course crossing the finish line is huge but when there's expectation on your shoulders it's almost more a sense of relief um, it's a relief that you've done it because 
with expectation it doesn't mean you're gonna win but it means there's pressure put on you because you have the potential to win. Now, there's eight people in the final who all have the potential to win and they're all good enough to win that race. But you have to go into that race believing you can win it. Um, and you have to have done all, all your preparation to the very best you can. You can't help if you got injured. You can't help if you got ill. But you have to do everything you can to be in the best shape on that day. And then if you win the race, you 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 can hold your head up high and you go, I won because I put the work in. If you don't win the race, you can hold your head up high. You shake the other person's hand. You go, you had a better race than me today and I'll get you next time. And that and that's how you kind of prepare for these big events. But that's sort of the long way around. Saying, that's what it feels like. So when, you, when I hit the home straight and I took the lead, then it's 90 metres of just hoping and praying that you can hang on because the, the person behind me on, when you watch the film of the race, it looks quite a big distance. It's less than a second. So it is, and they're coming fast and they sound closer than they are. And then you can hear the crowd and you, you're just hoping and praying. We've all watched sport, especially athletics. You've watched people lose the races on the finish lines. The person closing you down, if they know they're gaining on you, has a lot more strength inside them than you do. They know they're going quicker than you. And they can feel it and they and they and they can almost work it out in their heads and they might might not get you, whereas you don't know what's going on behind you. So you've just got your head down and you're just hoping and hoping and hoping you're gonna cross the finish line. Of course, when you do it, then it's just a massive sense of relief. Yeah, I love that. So what's going through your head though when you don't win? Um, I mean when you don't win, it's I, so in Sydney, I won a bronze medal. But actually, I didn't win a gold medal. I made mistakes in Sydney that cost me the potential of winning the gold medal. Um, I went off. I had there was a false start at the start of the race. It wasn't my fault, but there was a false start, and I can, I just wasn't focused. I couldn't get my head in the right place. And I can remember after the false start, thinking, "This is brilliant." Normally, you'd hate a false start. I was thinking, "This is brilliant. This gives me another chance to focus." But I still didn't manage it. I still wasn't in the right. We call it being in the zone, and I wasn't in the zone. I my head was just spinning. I could hear everything going on around me. Things were agitating me. And I just was just a quarter of a second too slow in the first 50 metres of the race. And that cost me the race because I was then chasing for the whole rest of the race. When you start chasing and you put in that extra bit and you're tense, everything tightens up a little bit and it cost me the race. And that race was gold, silver, bronze, 0 0.22 of a second. So it's a blink your eyes and three people went across that finish line. And I knew in my heart, as soon as I crossed that finish line, I've made mistakes. And that is really hard to take. And it takes a long time to come back from. But I just call it it's another one of life's hurdles. And it's how you overcome these hurdles. That's what enables you to go on and achieve the great things. So I sat down with my coach after that race. Uh, my coach's name is A.O. Falola. And he's like, well, Dan, that didn't quite go according to plan. Um, what can we learn from it? Now we park it, we leave it, we move on and we start going forward. And that's how in sport you have to learn to deal with those situations. I always talk about when I work with businesses and students as well as I lost more races than I ever won. I had to learn to lose races before I could ever learn to win one. Because in every single race you lose, you're learning. The idea as an athlete is to try and not lose the big ones. The idea is to save your best, give your best performance on that one day. Make all your mistakes in the build up to it. Uh, but of course, it doesn't always work like that. But that's how we have to that's how we have to deal with it. So we try and learn from mistakes as we move forward. So we make less mistakes on the big stage. Um, but of course, we make mistakes and it goes wrong and we don't always win. And it's it's sport and it's, it's how you deal with that. And the true, true champions in sport, in business, in life are the ones that have overcome multiple, multiple, multiple hurdles. Yeah. So if you ask anybody who's successful, it doesn't matter what they're successful in. They will never tell you it was easy. They will never tell you they won everything, or succeeded at everything, or every invention they came up with was brilliant. It was full of setbacks, mistakes, failures. Although failures is, a, is a, I sort of struggle with that word because it's not always a failure if you've learned something from it. If you've learned something from it, it's not necessarily a huge failure. You might not have got the result you wanted. You got a result, but just not the one you wanted. But there's still a result in there, and you can take something from that. You can take some positives. And the negatives in there, you can learn from them and turn them into positives. And it's easier said than done, um, but you have to. It's how we get through life. 
Um, but it doesn't mean we make that we make excuses for it as well. It doesn't mean we say, I said, it doesn't matter that I didn't win because you know this went wrong and it, it, we, we still feel it, it still hurts. And it took me two years to get over Sydney and it took me two years to really start moving forward again. But I did, and that's what drove me into Athens and gave me that extra drive and resilience to be successful in Athens. So I love this because how do you, so, you know, going from Sydney to Athens, but how would you or do athletes or sports people, you know, how do you get your head around defeat? How do you get over defeat? Well, I think you, I I, I mean, I, so... The, the way I describe this is what I learned pre Athens. And so when you get ready for a major big event and, and the pressure starts to build and the nerves start to build and you start to think that this is, this is the be all and end all this race. Like, and, and it's almost life and death. And, but it's not right. It's just running in a circle. It's sport. And yes, it has implications if you do or don't win, like positive implications. If you win you use sponsorship contracts and stuff like that, if you don't win, you can lose sponsorship contracts and lose your funding and not make teams and things like that. But generally it's, it's sport. And it, and I, and I used to get so much pressure on myself before I ran. And I, I remember before the Athens games was in the holding camp and one of the other athletes there, he was a guide runner for a blind, for a blind runner. Mm-hmm. And I was just chatting to him one day. And this is about this was about two weeks before my race. So we're in the holding camp. We're in Cyprus, ready before we move to Athens. We just chat and we just chat about what we would do if we weren't athletes. And I said, if I was an athlete, actually, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a police officer, but I didn't want to just be a normal police officer. I get, I get you have to do that. But I wanted to be like river police or dog handler or something like that, you know. And um, and so and, and he said, we, but you could do that. And I was like. Yeah, but I'd never pass the physical when he went, but, and that was his job to train the officers to pass the physicals and do the self defense. And he said, you, you, You'd breeze it, Dan, you'd, you'd absolutely be able to do it. And it was, and it didn't mean I wanted them wanted to become a police officer again, but it was that moment there, there was that moment where I suddenly went, Do you know what? Running's not the be all and end all. And actually, if I win this race, it's not going to change my life massively. I'm still the same person, like, and if you lose the race, you're still the same person and your life still goes on. And that's something I learned. Like, yeah, you have this perception as an athlete, like when you leave your accommodation to go and do your final, that when you come back, the world's going to be a different place. But actually you learn through the losses and the wins. When you open the, when you come back and you open that door to your room, your room's still a mess. Right? <laughs> the mess is still there, whether you won or lost. Your mates still think you're an idiot, whether you win or lose. And actually it's never long till you laugh. And um, so even, our, even after the big losses, it's never long till you laugh. Um, and, and that I've always sort of tried to carry that bit through. And, and that's what's even in, and that's what I've been noticeable in life in general as well. And, you know, everyone goes through tough times in their lives. And that's one thing you're guaranteed in life. At some point you'll face some hardship. Life's not easy and that's not negative. That's just, that's life. And it, some people will unfortunately suffer more hardship than others, but Whenever you go through it, it doesn't matter how dark it gets sometimes, there's always, you know, there's always a moment where you'll laugh or you'll smile. And friends are really good for that. They can pick you out of the darkest moments and make you smile. And it might only be for a very short period of time, but it it just reminds you that actually this isn't the way it's going to be, right? Yes, you know, if you've you've gone through some tough times, it may be difficult moving forward, but then you will still smile, you will still laugh, and people and we have the ability to do that. And, and sport was no different. I remember in uh, in um, the World Athletics Championships in, in 2002 and I came fourth, which doesn't sound bad coming fourth in the world, but it's, you know, coming fourth when you're funded to be a medalist meant I lost all my funding and I knew that was going to happen. It's a very, very tough world sport, which is why you have a lot of mental health problems within sport. And um, and I'm, my coach, he wasn't there at that event. He used, you know, can always be there. I always had a thing with him. Like, didn't matter, matter if, However long after a race I phoned him, did, did, t- I kind of told him how well I did. So when I broke the world record, I don't even think I'd finished running and I was on the phone. Hey, oh, I did it. I smashed the world record. And um, whereas when I came fourth and I'd messed the race up and I came fourth and I knew the, the consequences of that, what they would be, one and a half hours after my race, I phoned my coach and I phoned him. He didn't even ask me. He just laughed down the phone. And bear in mind, this is my coach, and I've just raced in a world championship final. And he's just laughed. And he went, right, what went wrong? And I told him what went wrong. He went, right, well, it's done. It's over. Park it. 
we move on. And, and that's kind of some of the mindset we use as sports to get over those defeats. Because once it's done, it's done. There's nothing you can do about it. And actually, as a sports person as well, you lay yourself bare. Like you're out there at your most vulnerable. You know, you're wearing skimpy clothes. If you, when you finish the race, you've usually got dribble down the side of your face. You look a mess. You're absolutely exhausted. And you're then trying to deal with the fact that you've messed up your big chance. And then you've got a camera in front of your face and a microphone. And they're saying, no, Dan, what went wrong? You've absolutely stuffed that one, didn't you? Because um, the, 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 the reporters and the commentators won't hold back. Right? They, they will say it as it is. That's their job. So you get used to it. And it's, it's part of sport and you have to learn to deal with it. And, um, and you have to learn how to move on from it. And, and if you can, that's what makes you successful. You've got me in stitches part of this. Um, okay, so my next question is, if you, obviously this channel is aimed to support and promote positive mental fitness to, to children and young people between the ages of 10 and 19, if not some adults too. But if, you, if we had a young person that had a sport or kind of had something that they want to, to focus towards, what would be your guidance to kind of offer them? The first thing is you've got to love what you do. Um, you can't go into something thinking, I want to be famous at this or I want to be a premiership footballer is the one we hear all the time, right? Which is great because you can have those dreams because people do make it. Um, but the first thing you've got to do is love it. And the first, like, so if you take premiership football, because everyone, everyone knows it, you see it. If you speak to the footballers, the first thing you'll find is they've been kicking a ball since they were one year old, right? They love football. It's in their blood. Athletes have been running since they were kids normally. They absolutely love running or throwing or jumping or they love the sport. You've got to love it first. And then it's about just enjoying the journey. Don't put too much expectation on yourself. Just enjoy that journey. Enjoy the training. Enjoy the racing. Enjoy the losses. Right? Because if you beat yourself up too much every time you lose, you're not going to last long in a sport because you're never going to win everything. Nobody's ever won everything. So you're going to have to learn to lose the races so or lose the matches or lose the competition so be prepared for that as well be prepared for the fact you're going to have periods where you suddenly can't do it because you're going to get injured or you're going to get ill and it's always at the wrong time and then you're also going to have times when you just underperform there's no reason for it you just can't put your finger on it but it's just not working out for you so there's all these things that come together and it's not negative it's part of sport but it's what makes champions champions because they're the ones that navigate all that so my advice to anyone who's starting on a journey and has a dream and an aspiration is, you know, just check in yourself, make sure you love what you're doing. You're not doing it because someone else wants you to do it. or You're not doing it because you think it's going to bring you fame and fortune. You're doing it because you love it. And if you love it, nothing else matters. It, it doesn't matter if you become number one in the world. It doesn't matter if you don't even make the school third team. And that's the thing that's always amazed me, like, is I was very lucky I was a professional sports person. People always ask me who inspires me. And actually, my answer is not what you'd expect. So I grew up in an era of Sebastian Co, Steve Cram and Steve Ovette, the, the famous 850 meter runners. And, um, and people would expect me to say that because I'm an eight, eight runner. And of course, I would wanted to emulate what they did. But actually, people that inspire me are always people that do it for the love. They do it just because. So, they, so for every professional athlete, there's people out there that train even harder, are more dedicated, know more about the sport, and yet they're not even going to make that 13. You know, they're never going to get selected for the for. But they they do it because they love it and they're passionate about it. Those are the people that inspire me because they just have so much passion, and that's what you have to have to sort of get you through a career in sport. But if you get there and you're lucky, it's a great career. So never. Never let anyone sort of squash your expectations or your dreams if you want to be a professional sports person. But the other advice is always make sure you've got something as well, because a sporting life is short. It's always short. Um, so not your life is short, but the, the sporting life is short. You have a life after sport. So it's always it's always important as well for sports people to make sure you've got other things. So my other thing was always speaking. So I, I was speaking in schools, I was speaking in businesses while I was an athlete, because I always knew that in sport it's going to end sometime and I've got to have something that I can fall back on but also even while I was doing my sport and I was going well I had something else to take my mind off the sport because for most people to de-stress from the day you go for a run or the gym or you play sport or you go for a walk or you do exercise 
if it's a sports person, you can't do that. You've got to find something else to de-stress because sport is your stress. So I, my, my de-stress was going off and doing other things. So it's just putting all these things together to enable you to go forward and have that, that career. Um, but of course, it, you don't start with the career mentality. It's about, right, where am I now? Where do I want to get to next? What's my next stage? And that's how I work through it. It's always one stage at a time. So Danny, in what way can exercise benefit our mental health or for at least you personally so for me i love going out for a run and I, I just, i'm very slow i plod along now it's just that it's the fresh air it's the changing mindset i find it opens my mind it gives me i, I come up with different ideas for my business and things i'm doing because i'm free i'm not sort of constrained by trying to think of things you just freedom and it just takes you away from every day so, and of course, if you do team sport, you've got that camaraderie, the, the friendship, you've got the banter, you've got everything that goes with team sport that just takes you away from everyday life, be it the normal stresses of everyday life uh, in school, you know, coming up exams and things like that, or in work, you know, the stress of work or things you've got going on in your life. It's that ability to just take you out of that, put you somewhere else for a little while. And of course, you've got the positive benefits of fitness as well, fitness, well-being, and as, as anyone who's embarked on a healthier lifestyle, especially if you didn't have a healthy lifestyle, you'll know that actually once you start doing exercise, it becomes a lot easier to live the healthier lifestyle. So because you, you engage with it a lot more. Um, and it was no different with me as an athlete when I first started my journey as an athlete. Yes, I ate healthily, but I wasn't dedicated as an athlete. And as I went through my career and I realised that I was getting closer and closer to each target that I set myself, I would dedicate and focus more. And part of that dedication and focus was, you know, better diet, better well-being, better mental health. But I was working on all that to enable me to get to a point. But it, it wasn't a chore. I wasn't doing it because I had to. I was doing it because it was just part of my life and it was feeling good at the time. And I think that's the important part of it is, you know, seeing exercise as something to not as a chore, not as and if you actually if you're if you're doing activity for fitness reasons or you feel that like you need to do a fitness reason. And you hate it you can't stand the thought of going out the door to do whatever you're doing you're probably doing the wrong thing right find the thing that you love it doesn't have to be running it doesn't have to be football you can go for a nice walk you can do a class you can go for a swim you can do anything as long as it's activity but just find something that floats your boat because that way you're going to be more engaged with it and you enjoy it more yeah i love there's this saying kind of um what is it I love this saying, it's about kind of the importance of exercising for your mind and not necessarily so much for your body. And I think that's so true. Where can we find Danny? Where can we find more information about you on social media, please? Um, I, I mean, I'm on social media. I'm not on it all the time. Um, I, I find social media my stress thing. I don't, don't necessarily love it. I do post things on there. I have a website, dannycraze.co.uk. It's got all information on it about me. So there is pictures on social media on the usual chat on the usual channels. There's plenty of videos of my races out there. People can look up. Um, it's, I speak in school, so that's how you can hear me as well. I bring me into schools and I do presentations in there, um, either assemblies or you often at moments of choice. So when they're doing a secondary school, when they're doing options or year six as they're ready to go up to year seven. So these big change moments in their lives. Um, yeah and that's where you find the information out about me there's, there's plenty of amazing i get surprised sometimes what my, my children find about me stuff i didn't even know existed i love that okay so danny my last question what advice would you give to your 16 year old self well so my yeah so my 16 year old self would be it would be sort of it would definitely have been knuckled down a little bit more um I wasn't the best at school. I wasn't naughty, but I was always distracted. I was always, all my school reports said if Danny could do his maths class on the field, it would be happier and he would do a lot better. Or if Danny could stop talking, he would be a lot, he would do, be a lot more successful. Um, but in terms of, so my, my ambition, my, my passion was to be a professional rugby player, or semi-professional back then it was. Um, and that was my dream and my ambition. And I was on that journey. I was already playing for the East of England. Um, I'd been voted man of the tour when I'd gone on tour with the squad. But I didn't get something. There was something missing. So I, potentially I had the talent. Um, I went training every Tuesday, Thursday. But I didn't get that talent is never enough. In, if you want to be successful, it's not just sport, it's in anything. 
it's talent plus hard work and I think plus guidance as well so in school you've got your teachers and your support staff you know in sport you've got your coaches in the world of work you've got coaching mentoring and things like that um so you need that extra level as well I think to sort of keep help you have some clarity about what you're trying to achieve but those things so yes I had the potential to be a semi-professional if not professional rugby player but I didn't have that understanding that the people that are successful the ones that put in the extra they put in that extra there's a reason why Ronaldo in football is still playing at the level he's playing at in his 30s you know and, and been seen as one of the most successful and best football players in the world consistently for a number of years it's not just because he was born with a talent lots of people are born with talent it's just that he has overcome all the hurdles along the way he's gone through the barriers he's overcome the losses the setbacks to make him successful and he puts in the extra bit of work so if you want to be successful you've got to be prepared to put in that extra bit of work but if you've chosen something you love doing it doesn't feel like work it just feels like people people often talk about sacrifices so i made a lot of sacrifices to be an athlete missed all friends weddings all the boys holidays missed their children's birthdays but i never called them sacrifices i called them life choices i chose to be an athlete and then my friends chose to come and watch me race, which meant they never held it against me. You know, they supported me in everything I did. So that's my advice really to the 16 year old self is don't be prepared to dedicate towards something. It doesn't mean it has to be all encompassing. doesn't mean you don't do anything else. But had I potentially worked a little bit harder at my sport, maybe potentially I could have had a rugby career. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. So that's history and you know, I don't dwell on it. But that's that's the lesson that I would tell my 16 year old self is that if you want something, be prepared to put in the extra bit of work, because if you don't put in the extra bit of work, someone else will. Yeah. Yeah. Danny, thank you so, so much for your time. I've loved doing this video. I've loved it that it celebrates our second year anniversary with the channel. And I'm just super grateful for your time. I've seen you speak. You're incredible in schools. So make sure that, you know, teachers and professionals kind of checking this out make sure you check out his um website and danny i love watching you on the tv whenever you're doing the, the live coverage um for any of the power athletics so just keep doing what you're doing and yeah thank you for your time cheers thank you see you later